Hi, this is Lex, and welcome to the Fintech Blueprint. It's your podcast about fintech, decentralized finance, digital banking, investing, robo-advice, artificial intelligence, and all the other frontier technology that is transforming financial services. To get more content, like an illustrated transcript of this conversation in your inbox, subscribe at fintechblueprint.com. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the podcast. I'm super excited for the conversation today with one of my friends and most influential people in the UK fintech scene, Simon Taylor. He's the head of strategy and content at Sardine, which is a modern compliance infrastructure. We'll talk about that. He's also, of course, a co-founder of 11FS, one of the core UK digital banking leaders, uh, founder for the Global Digital Finance Organization in the UK focused on blockchain, has a background in blockchain at Barclays, as well as an innovation and tech background at TISA. So all around really deep in fintech, and we're going to have a fantastic conversation. Simon, welcome to the podcast. Lex, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Oh, my pleasure. If anything, I have to apologize for taking so long to get you on here finally. You had a lot to do. You're a busy guy. You got lots to write, and you've had some amazing, amazing guests. Frankly, I'm honored. So thank you so much. I was I was busy liquidating three arrows capital uh, <laughs> right right before this call. I had to go do that. See, we found the source already. Everybody <laughs> thought it was the the big CFI lenders. Everybody thought it was the DeFi protocols getting paid back. It was Lex. Just me and my spreadsheets. Let's introduce a little bit of your background and how you got into the space before we hop into the meat of the conversation, which is going to be around payments and acquiring and some of the Revolut news. And so maybe just tell us how you got started in innovation and tech and financial services. What were some of your foundational experiences? Sure. So I'm one of those kids in the UK who left school at 16, I got an apprenticeship working for British Telecom doing software engineering. And my job there was to spend most of my time taking stuff that was happening in their old mainframe technologies and making it available on their public website. So this was an education in how do old IBM mainframes really work at the software level. And it was, it was kind of interesting, and I learned enough to be dangerous about computer science. And then I did a bunch of other roles for, for British Telecom for a few years. In 2008, I had a health issue and then sort of reevaluated what I wanted from life, built a couple of businesses and then eventually closed those. And then eventually the money ran out and I had to get a job. And that's when I started working at a company called Tesis. Tesis is an issuer processor. So their clients would include folks like Capital One, NatWest Group, ING in the Netherlands. And they are probably best described as the IT department for credit cards and debit cards for, for a lot of banks. They would help with everything from producing the card to the mainframe infrastructure to all of the software you need to manage it on your website. And my job initially was to work in the data center. So now I understood the plumbing with my hands a little bit better. I found myself working in a department with a bunch of folks who were ex-army who knew I'd talked my way into the job. And instead of like engaging with that and admitting that I didn't understand fintech at the time, I would go hide in the bathroom and read Twitter on my BlackBerry. And I would be reading about things on TechCrunch and this thing called Cybos and this fintech that was starting to emerge. And I got really inspired by it, frankly. I got super inspired and I started emailing people internally about, hey, we should do something with this. And instead of firing me, they created a job for me as the head of innovation. And my job was to build new products, sell it to the first customer and hand it to the sales team. Did that with a mobile app in, in 2011. It was the second mobile banking app to launch in the UK market. And we were able to get that to market really quickly because I found a supplier who understood the mainframe, who was already connected. So that career history had really come together really nicely as a, on a practitioner level. But I was also given an education in how the business side of credit card issuing worked from, from that team that I worked with and very grateful to all those folks. 
I was then headhunted by Barclays to come lead some mobile payments change for them. So now I'm getting experience not just of the cards world, but local clearing, as we'd call it. So faster payments, SEPA, SWIFT payments. How do all of those work and how do you make them work in a mobile app? And that was good experience. Enjoyed it a lot, certainly took a lot from it. But I was then asked by the then chief digital officer to help them set up the platform Barclays Rise, which if you Google it, is an innovation platform. And I was on the the founding team of that to really work with fintech and bring Barclays into the fintech space. I helped run the the London side of that. It did really, really well. And I I learned a lot about sort of VC and investment and startup culture and, and got a lot, lot closer to that and became a translator of the startup world back into the bank. And while doing that, I was always a video gamer. I always had NVIDIA cards. I'd I'd looked at Bitcoin and dismissed it, but sort of got really attached to the Ethereum community and the initial Ethereum white paper. And I was inspired by the idea that if Bitcoin was sort of a very blunt instrument like a machete, then Ethereum was a Swiss army knife that was going to be potentially unlocking a lot more in the world. I didn't know what specifically at the time, but it just instinctively felt right. And I went to the first ever London Ethereum meetup where Charles Hoskinson, of all people, gave a talk, Vitaly Buterin Skyped in. And having done that, I took that back into the bank. And instead of calling me crazy, they made me head of crypto R&D for, for the bank. And then I was gradually rolled out in front of all of the folks in the bank to explain what crypto was to the head of AML, to the head of compliance, but also to to regulators and governments. So now I'm getting an education in how they think and what their worries are about crypto. And that's, that sort of led me to go and found 11FS to, to sort of scale that knowledge. So that brings us more or less up to date and hopefully gives you a, a flavor. And what a delicious flavor it is. you know. And I think there's not much difference between being the crazy person or being called crazy and being given the job of figuring out crypto inside of an investment bank. <laughs> so true. And now you are at Sardine, right? Yes. So having enjoyed the journey of of being a part of 11FS for the last six years, I really wanted to get closer to everything happening in crypto and fraud. And Sardine's customers includes everybody like FTX and MoonPay and Brex. And to learn from founders like Soups and Adi and Zahid, how they think about data and how they think about on-chain and off-chain and how you can really start to bring compliance into the Web3 space is is really nuanced and, and an opportunity to learn that I got extremely extremely excited by. I think that if we are going to have a brand new financial system, an alternative financial system, then it's going to need liquidity. And if we're going to get liquidity into it, people are going to need confidence. And if we're going to confidently move money into Web3, then we're going to need to figure out where all the risks are and where all the problems are. So the opportunity to learn that was hugely exciting. There is a thread that's really compelling to me kind of through your background, which is valuable to the listener, right? Which is that where you are now is probably a pretty good indicator of what's happening next because you've been pretty on trend in terms of your career choices, in terms of following the frontier in the financial industry, but towards where it's evolving, right? So whether it's getting mainframes online, whether it's figuring out how to do digital issuing or how to do mobile banking apps in 2011, or whether that's figuring out how to modernize an entire banking platform and start thinking around integrating blockchain into it. you know. And I think just, again, to point out the judgment that kind of the next frontier for you is how do you get transactions and commerce inside of a Web3 environment to kind of simplify it just to be safer and to be a good place for people? To me, that's a vector that connects And the other thing I want to kind of frame up is, and I've been struggling with this idea. I really, it's a bit challenging for me because I have a similar vector, but my vector comes from the investment management side of the world. So I felt very comfortable with this capital markets version of what Web3 has been. And, you know, I feel more uncomfortable with the direction where it's going, but I think is the more correct direction, which is commerce payments and real economic activity. So things like acquiring, things like merchants, things like 
you know, treating seriously the idea that there is a Web3 GDP, I think is the direction that we're going. As a very broad question to you, I wanted to get your impression on this connection between payments, banking, and commerce. People making things, selling them, and then how finance just starts to get its gears into that activity based on your experience. Yeah, it's very helpful if you're selling something to be able to get paid. And there's always been a number of ways to get paid. And if you go right back to first principles, I could try and exchange your family pet for a cabbage. But what's one family pet worth? How many cabbages is that worth? You know, barter is particularly frustrating. So we invent cash. Cash you know, is particularly hard to challenge uh, travel at scale because the problem with being carrying around a million dollars in cash is you're probably a target for for being attacked. So we invent checks. But that's pretty hard to accept and make sure it won't bounce when you walk into a store or when you're just trying to buy some groceries. So, of course, along comes cards in the 50s and 60s, Bank Americard, MasterCard, Discover, Diners Club, etc. And their key innovation was to be able to promise the merchant they would get paid and allow everything else to get figured out later. So I walk into a store with my card and I make a promise to the merchant that they will get paid, but it's the bank that then steps in and and manages that. Or in many cases now, it's actually the network. It's Visa and it's MasterCard. And so the glue that connects this becomes these, these networks, these card schemes that really manage all of the things that could go wrong between me presenting a bit of plastic and the merchant eventually receiving the money. And the innovations there have have built over the years, but are essentially split into to two houses. You've got the, the world of issuing and the world of acquiring. So your bank issues you a debit card. So they are the issuer. Nice and simple. The merchant's bank or your the store in front of you, the store you walk into, is acquiring money, hence they're the acquirer. Which, you know, it sounds super complex language, but actually it's like, oh, okay, it's actually pretty, pretty logical. And then the card network and the card scheme are the people that link together you, the merchant, the issuer, and the acquirer. And that's why they call it the, the four-party model. In, in many cases, that's true. The possible exception is Amex and a few other private label cards. But that's probably in the easiest way to think about it. And so when I walk into a store and go to make a transaction, What I'm actually doing is authorizing all of that stuff to happen. The money isn't settling. So people assume that when you've bought something in store, you have paid that merchant, you've pushed money to them. It's not actually what's happened. What's happened is you've put your card into the card reader or on the card reader. The card reader has called the acquirer. The acquirer has called Visa or MasterCard. Visa and MasterCard has called your bank and your bank has said, ah, you know, Lex has enough money in his bank. Let the customer walk out of the store with the goods. We will figure the rest out later. And that's called an authorization. Or for Web3 nerds, it's like a, a layer two over the top of the banking infrastructure. So that auth happens almost instantly. It's incredible. But no money has actually moved. It's not until later that the clearing and the settlement takes place where the card schemes and all of the banks figure out who, which bank owes which other bank money and they credit the merchants. And so that's worked for you know, several decades, but it was particularly challenging for smaller businesses to take payments online in the early days of the internet. So we saw a new generation of companies help with that, companies like PayPal, companies like Cybersource, later acquired by Visa, to help that online acquiring. And then we saw sort of the last decade, decade and a half, smaller merchants really losing out. So you've got micro merchants, a food truck, a mom and pop store, where the traditional banks would be charging high fees or a lot per transaction for that customer, uh, for that merchant to be able to accept payments in store. Or if you just have a tiny little Shopify page, it can be very expensive to take payments. So you get this new generation of fintech companies, everybody from Square to Toast to iZettle to everything in between, that launch really simple, easy-to-use products that innovate on the user experience and innovate on the pricing to be able to make all of that 
come together. So that's like my whistle stop tour of, of kind of payments at the highest level. And there are probably payments experts and nerds out there pointing out several technical inaccuracies, but I hope that that was a good enough broad explainer for everybody. That's fantastic. And I feel like with any time I'm looking at payments and I hear the words, I have to just read them or ask for an explanation over and over again, because like you say, the words can be they can feel complicated when in fact, once you understand the terms, they do become much more intuitive. I have a question that I've never quite figured out about acquirers. So I kind of think of them almost as institutional salespeople. You know, so if you have like an asset management fund and we share this terminology, right? So an asset manager will manufacture a fund and then they need that fund to be living inside of a bank or financial advisor footprint or some wealth manager. They'll have institutional salespeople that'll go and distribute that fund to the interface that touches consumers, that touches end investors and users. And so similarly in my mind, acquirers are kind of like this in the sense that they go out and they go and distribute to all of the merchants. And the question I'm curious about is like, actually, do you have an idea for that go-to-market motion? Like, how does a bank, how does an acquirer go out and, you know, sign up these shops? Like, do they show up with like a contract and try to convince the, the person at the checkout counter? Or like, how does that work? It depends. So you've got to consider the scale of the merchant. So if your merchant is Walmart, then you better believe that the banks have an army of salespeople that are you know, trying to know everybody inside that organization. They're probably doing bits of treasury management for them. They're doing FX. They're helping them with interest rate swaps and, and credit defaults and blah, blah, blah. They'll have this big, complex relationship. And as part of that relationship, they're going to try and be the primary acquirer for, for everything they do. But of course, a merchant that size has a lot of buying power, probably wants two or three banks and, and acquirers in, in the mix. So on the, the deep institutional side, it, it looks like any enterprise sale. It's very complicated. There's probably multiple partners involved. The next layer down, though, is, is kind of the independent sales organization, the ISO. So this is like a, a broker for acquirers almost. And you'll see then there are also some ISOs that are producers of the the hardware itself. So you think about a Verifone, Ingenico, you know, like those words you see on the card reader in stores. It turns out those are companies and they do an awful lot of work themselves and they work with acquirers and in some markets they have acquiring divisions and so on. So there's that layer in, in, the, in, in the piece as well. So that's independent sales organizations and they're split into wholesale and retail and there's a whole bunch of subdivision there. And then there's even a layer above that. So the innovation Stripe came up with is that they are not actually an independent sales organization. They are a merchant. So oh, at least they were in the early days. They, they may be more complex now. And what being a merchant allowed them to do was manage a lot of the complexities that traditionally the acquiring industry pushed onto a merchant. So all of the stuff you have to get in place as a Walmart in order to be able to comply with all of the regulation of accepting payments and dealing with banking and dealing with, with all of the laws that come with it, that was all taken care of by Stripe, which basically meant they could hide it all from the user and present a developer with nine lines of code. And that is, is what really sort of took us to the next generation of micro merchants and small merchants who are often considered you know, master merchant and sub merchant. So this is a layer cake that goes all the way up from acquirer to ISO to master merchant to sub merchant. Super interesting. So I think MoonPay is also set up as a merchant. They're set up as a merchant of crypto assets. And then on the other side, they use zero hash to connect into a market venue of the stuff. So there is structural arbitrage here. Further question around this idea. So I imagine that at some point when you get to really kind of micro merchants like the, you know, the hot dog cart or the independent comic book publisher, you start getting into the world of Square and all the various dongles that would attach to the phone and are now kind of in the app. And you get from 
the sort of push enterprisey acquiring, going out and acquiring merchants to something that looks a lot more like a pull marketing strategy where you're generating demand and demand is going to you to buy point of sale terminals or whatever. Can you pull apart for us these ideas at the end of the really small business and then maybe also carve up the differences between what I'm guessing are you know, gateways and processors and all sorts of other software that attaches to the core business model? Yeah, I, I guess the biggest thing to think about is actually just starting with that business model point. If I was Walmart, the the sticker price of a square, the sticker price of a stripe is is ludicrously expensive. It is almost impossible to justify that for the volume of transactions they're doing. So for them, it's worth doing the extra work because if they are seeing billions, possibly even trillions of dollars of trade coming through, saving, you know, in, instead of paying $2.50 plus 30 cents, or sorry, 2.5% plus 30 cents on every transaction, if they can get that down to 1% plus five cents, my goodness, you better believe that hits the bottom line and the fine margins really, really matter. But if I'm a hot dog stand, then 2.5% of a hot dog is not a massive amount of money. And actually, it probably increases my sales much, much more to be able to accept cards than it does cost me. So the the value proposition is fundamentally different to the hot dog side. Can you tell it's lunchtime when we're recording this? I'm, I'm like, <laughs> you're, you're, yeah, you're negotiating over like two and a half percent of a hot dog. Yeah, if vegan hot dogs are also available and good. You know, like I'll take everything. But the nature of that business model is fundamentally different. And the other thing that you prioritize is dealing with all of that abstraction. So where I would have gone to a gateway historically in a payment service provider to set up an e-commerce website. And then separately, I would have gone to an independent sales organization who might have connected to a processor who might have connected me to an acquiring bank. My goodness, that was a lot to put together. The likes of Square just hide all of that from you. And behind the scenes, there's an acquiring bank. Behind the scenes, there's a processor. Behind the scenes... There may even be gateways or they may build their own. But what they're doing is they're packaging all of that together and distributing it neatly to the small business who effectively is getting a consumer-grade experience and pricing that doesn't impact them from a unit economic standpoint nearly like it would the go-to-market motion of, of, of a big acquirer. Um, processor is an interesting term. There are issuer processes and acquirer processes. So if you think about the role that a bank is playing, the acquiring bank and the issuing bank is holding the account on behalf of the consumer or the merchant. The processor is the person that connects to Visa or MasterCard. The issuer processor is the person that connects to Visa on behalf of the consumer or business with a card. And the acquirer is the person that connects to Visa, MasterCard, or whoever the card scheme is on behalf of the merchant. Above that, you might get a gateway who helps you connect into many processes and accept many payments types and deal with many layers of complexity. But in order to work with the gateway, you probably still need to be a merchant. You may also then work with an independent sales organization to get the actual hardware itself. And that works if you're Walmart. It doesn't necessarily work if you are the consumer-grade hot dog stand or whoever you are and whatever it is you're selling. So the pricing difference, the business model differs, and the go-to-market motion differs based on your unit economics of your customer and the problem space of your customer. They say disruptive innovation is segmenting the market, going after the people who are least served and working your way up. It's exactly what Stripe did, and it's exactly what Square did, because the unit economics that the industry worked with historically worked for very large merchants. But it was very hard to get there to justify going after the smaller mom and pop stores, especially via a branch network, which was their distribution, and offer them anything like the kind of upfront fees that a Square would or an Izettel would because they they were fundamentally thinking different about how they make money and what their cost structure was. So that's the often the value of innovation is you get to look at not just the the distribution but how you manufacture the pricing and the business model as well. 
super helpful. Thank you for that. That's like the introduction, right? I want to switch us into a piece of news that came out about Revolut. And the piece of news is that Revolut Business, which is their, I guess, their product stream focused on business accounts, which historically have been depository accounts, launching an acquiring solution, I think, in something like 29 European countries. And this feels like a very adjacent play. There are not a lot of neobanks that have gone from, you know, we're going to have users and manage their money at rest, you know, and maybe monetize through their spending on a card to being in the business of going out to merchants and trying to be their solution from a commerce perspective. Now, the only exception in my mind in the sort of modern world is looking at Square and seeing Square starting from being embedded with all the merchants and enabling payments and then getting out of that market position into a position where they are, you know, banking the merchants, where they're offering the bank accounts, and then they're building out Cash App with the retail users and sort of building that empire out of acquiring. How do you think about Revolut's entry? Like, how would you even characterize it in terms of what they're doing? Revolut is a blitzscaler. If you look at what they've done, they've gone into as many markets as possible as quickly as possible. They've thrown as many features at consumers as they could as quickly as possible. And some of them are stuck, some of them haven't. And it's it's enabled them to, to scale, but it's also meant some experiments failed. And... If you then look at their business side of the house, business customers are potentially quite a little bit more attractive than consumers. They tend to have higher deposits, they have higher expenses. Getting 1% or even 0.5% interchange on a monthly spend of $1,000 is nice. Getting that on a monthly spend of $10,000, $100,000 is much nicer. So if you can get that customer, each customer is a lot more valuable than the consumers. There's arguably less of them, but they can become very valuable. So your effort impact kind of goes up, especially if your distribution is near as low cost as it is, as it is on the consumer side. The, the step into business made sense. And in doing that, they claim to have about half a million business customers. That is not an insignificant amount of businesses to, to have the, using the cards and using the product. And so it's natural then you would look to extend the product lines into those businesses. You've got a beachhead. You've got them using a few products. That's great. But a lot of these businesses, you would see their transactions and you might start to think, well, hang on a minute. They, there's a lot of these that are Shopify merchants. There's a lot of these that are physical stores, and they're using Revolut. Like That's naturally who's going to use the product. It's a simple, easy-to-use app. It's consumer-grade. It's prosumer. This is what people are going to start to use. So they have this, this foothold and this footprint. And if you can see in the transactions that people are trying to acquire payments and they're doing it with someone else why not launch that product and make it available to A, your existing customers, and B, the customers of tomorrow who will come and use it, come and use Revolut and then be naturally select Revolut as the, the provider because why not just have it all in one place of acquiring? So I think it makes sense. It's product extension, especially when fintech companies are chasing profitability and new sources of revenue. Product extension just makes logical sense to me. The sort of question you're toying at about does it lead to an end game, I think is an interesting one that we should unpack. Because you alluded to you know, where Square is going, where PayPal is going. They have lots of consumers, they have lots of merchants, but have they ever really got that flywheel kind of where they're able to reactivate consumers and they're able to bring them back to merchants and they're able to be more valuable to merchants? And that data flywheel, that has been the holy grail of financial services for at least a couple of decades. And, and we have to kind of unpack why nobody's achieved it yet. And I think the, the reason nobody's achieved it yet actually goes down to the infrastructure. A lot of data gets lost as soon as you make a payment. So imagine you are 
being targeted by Google, you're looking for what to go buy, you're picking a bunch of transactions, you're picking a bunch of products, you're shopping around, you're being retargeted, maybe you see something on social media, you eventually go to a price comparison website, you land on a couple of merchants, they start to try and pull you down into their checkout funnel. Loads of data happening here to try and enrich it, to try and upsell you, cross-sell you, and then you go and hit pay. And that payment data, yes, it gets stored by the merchant, but it gets squished down into a little file, a file format that really is based on what the least worst bank can comply with. And loads of information that the merchant had gets thrown away, and it squeezes down the visa pipes and ends up at the issuer. And so all that's really left is this this fraction of the information that was really known about you, the customer, and why you got to that purchase intent and buying decision, unless the merchant can actively retarget you and, and kind of do that. And that data flywheel gets broken in the cards world, and it gets broken in many of the other payments types. The only notable exception to that is buy now, pay later. So buy now, pay later, companies like Klarna, Afterpay, and Affirm have invented their own payment mark. And what they've gotten really, really good at is retargeting consumers with things that they might like to buy. To a consumer, Klarna and Affirm looks a lot more like a shopping app than it does a way to accept payments. But to a merchant, it looks like a way to bring new customers to my front door that I didn't have before. It gives me higher conversion, higher average order value. So it it becomes the ultimate no-brainer. But then Klarna itself, or Affirm itself, makes sure it captures all of that information about the consumer's activity and purchase intent on that website so that it can distribute that consumer out to other organizations and merchants in its network. That data flywheel works. And to me, that's why PayPal launched Buy Now, Pay Later. That's why you see Block and Square try to buy, or in fact did acquire, I think it was Afterpay. There is a view that if you could create your own payment network, you could have that data flywheel. However, creating your own payment network is always going to have limited upside because there are now, instead of there being two ecosystems of Visa and MasterCard, there's like 15. So which ecosystem are you in and which merchants are in it, which consumers are in it? You end up in in this kind of fragmentation where the data works inside the wall garden really, really well, but outside of it, it's still useless. So there are trade-offs there, and I don't think it's the perfect answer, but hopefully that kind of goes to towards where you were steering us. That's fantastic. Very clear thinking on that problem. I have two small questions, as I know we're coming up against time. The first is, if you look inside of a traditional bank, whether it's a Barclays or you know Wells Fargo, you described acquiring as a product extension from business banking. Again, if you look into any regular bank, is that the case that you park business banking next to the acquiring businesses? Do they talk to each other? Maybe. Potentially by reorg, but most big banks are roll-ups of, they, they look like a family tree. You know, they've acquired countless banks and countless other organizations over multiple decades, and their org design is a function of who they acquired or built and in what order. So they may reorg, but their go-to-market, their sales teams, their specialisms would be all different. So the distribution to micro-merchants might happen through br- the branch infrastructure in business banking. But what if you are, typically you'll see there's a threshold of revenues between 5 and 25 million, and you're now no longer a small business, you are an enterprise customer, and you work in an entirely separate division of the bank, and you don't deal with the branch, you deal with a relationship manager, And so does it live there? Does it live in global cash management and transaction banking? Or does it live in some other card division, like you would see with Barclay Card, for instance, and Chase Payment Tech? So there's not one answer to that question. It's kind of which is the the right form of governance? Which is the right form of politics? Which is the right way to look after your health? There isn't a clear academic answer to the question you asked, unfortunately. And I think, if anything, that highlights the potential value of a data layer that unites both sides of the needs of these businesses and how difficult it is to build them into traditional institutions, right? And sort of the all of the premise of embedded finance or data aggregation has been to just take what's there and reconnect it and unlock value. Look, there's so much more I want to ask, but I will save it for the next time we have a conversation. 
Thank you so much, Lex. My pleasure. In the meantime, if our listeners want to follow you or learn more about what you're doing, where should they go? Yeah, check me out on FinTech Brain Food. Just stick that into Google or sytaylor.substack.com. Email me, simon at sardine.ai, or follow me on Twitter at sytaylor. Look forward to hearing from you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Hi, everyone. That's it for this week's episode of the FinTech Blueprint. For more technical deep dives into all things fintech and decentralized finance, check out fintechblueprint.com and grab a free subscription to the newsletter. This is Lex, and I'll see you next time. <music>